Since its release in 2014, this mono box set has become legendary amongst Beatles collectors. In this video, I'll take an in-depth look at every aspect of it, including how it sounds when compared to the 1960s UK originals, and find out just how good it really is. Hi, I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions. This 2014 collection wasn't the first time the Beatles album had been released as a mono box set. Back in October 1982, EMI had issued the Beatles Mono Collection, which was a follow-up to the Blue Box Stereo Collection it had put together four years earlier. For us Beatles collectors, the date the 9th of the 9th 2009 was one of the most anticipated and exciting dates in Beatles history for nearly 20 years since the release of Anthology 1. Whilst many people around the world were getting married on this lucky date, I, like many other Beatles fans, rushed out to be the first to get their hands on the Beatles original studio recordings. A 16 CD remastered stereo box set, but also, crucially, the 10 CD The Beatles in Mono box set. This beautifully put together mono set gathered together 10 of the band's mono albums with a two disc Mono Masters album, and even included the original 1965 stereo mixes of Help and Rubber Soul, which had never been available on CD before. Also, Magical Mystery Tour had replaced Yellow Submarine, which had been included in the 1982 set, but as it was just a fold down of the stereo mix, it was unfortunately deemed unworthy of inclusion. However, by way of compensation, vintage mono mixes of the album's four original tracks were included on the Mono Masters album. Unlike the standard digipacks of the stereo set, this mono set was made in Japan and was of much higher quality. Each disc came in a beautifully made mini reproduction of the original UK flipback cover, with, like the stereo set, labels designed to match the UK pressings. They even had mini reproduction inner sleeves too. All were snugly housed in this glossy white box with an informative, well put together 44 page booklet containing in depth analysis of the Mono Masters, rare photos, and an intelligent opening essay by Kevin Howlett. Needless to say, it was a big success with both fans and audiophiles alike, and the initial pressing run of 50,000 sets worldwide sold out within a month. Fast forward now three years to 2012. The vinyl revival was gathering speed and was now something even Apple couldn't ignore. So turning to Abbey Road's team of first-rate producers and engineers, all the stops were pulled out to make this set the best sounding Beatles vinyl set ever. A lot of time and effort were spent in finding the right vintage gear and the original master tapes. Once those were in hand, they cleaned up the bad edits, applied surgical EQ designed to prevent issues such as sibilance and inner groove distortion, and cut the whole lot using high-rate 24-bit sampling to produce a set of LPs which would not only they hoped stay true to the originals, but improve upon them. When it was released in November 2012, all that time and effort seemed to have paid off, and the set received favourable reviews and sold well. But the main issue for audiophiles and hardened collectors was that it was a digitally sourced set, which meant it was basically the 2009 CDs on vinyl. Those issues aside, however, the big question was, where was the mono box? Well, the team at Abbey Road had already been hard at work on it, and the plan was to release the stereo and mono boxes together, much like it had been done with the CD sets in 2009. As with the stereo set, the plan had been to use the 2009 masters as the source, but just as the project was nearing completion, mastering supervisor Steve Berkowitz suggested a change of plan to mastering engineer Sean McGee. Berkowitz was a music industry veteran and had overseen many successful reissue projects for Sony's reissue label Legacy, most notably the acclaimed Bob Dylan Mono Collection in 2010, which crucially had been mastered from the original analog mono master tapes. 
So then it occurred to Berkowitz and McGee that instead of putting the digital monofiles on vinyl like the stereo set, why don't they cut the vinyl directly from the original analog mono master tapes? So that's what happened. And using original cutting engineer Harry Moss's notes as a guide, they scrapped the digital work and started again, but this time in analog. The original mono tape reels arrived from the vault in excellent condition. Only Please Please Me was showing any significant signs of age. The oxide and glue on that tape had started to shed, causing high frequency loss, and it was clear that it wasn't going to stand up to more than one or two plays. So a copy tape was made for cutting. Also, unwilling to risk damaging the original BTR tape machines on which the sessions were originally recorded, a more reliable later model Studer A80 was selected as the playback machine. Care was taken to make sure the azimuth of the playback heads was aligned to match exactly that of the machine used to record the song originally. In some cases, that meant making a nerve-wracking adjustment with a screwdriver as the tape was running through. The studio was fed into an EMI TG console where McGee set about replicating and tweaking Harry Moss's original EQ settings. McGee quickly found out how challenging cutting mono was and confessed that he couldn't have done what Harry Moss had achieved in the 60s on his equipment back then. It's a shame Harry was no longer around to take the compliment. One of the main issues to avoid when cutting a record is to stop the stylus jumping the grooves, and it's a real art balancing a good sounding mix with one which would track correctly at sufficient volume, with one which is too aggressive and make the stylus jump. This was actually a problem EMI encountered in 1963 on the Beatles' second album with the Beatles. That was recalled on the day of release due to jumping on Rollover Beethoven. However, it wasn't with the Beatles which was causing the headache this time, it was Rubber Soul. The album was recorded with such a huge amount of bass, it was decided that even modern systems wouldn't be able to handle the full amount on the tape. So although the bass was increased to a higher level than the 1965 cutting, they still had to hold some back. I'd give anything to listen to that tape and hear how much bass is actually on it. Before we address the subject of sound quality, let's have a look at the quality of these covers. Fortunately, they decided to copy the style of the CD covers by reproducing the flipbacks on the rear panels, which gives them a real authentic 1960s feel. It would have been perfect if the front panels had been laminated like the originals, instead of this dull eggshell-like finish. But the rear panels are really nice, and they even attempted to reproduce the slightly shiny rear panel of the early Please Please Me covers, and correctly use matte card for the rear panels of the other flipback sleeves. The cover of Beatles for Sale was always a weak affair, but this one is good and strong. The only real difference between this and the original is that the spine isn't pinched on the ends. Sgt Pepper also has its inner flip overs and also feels nice and heavy in the hand. The cutout sheet is here too, but the red and white inner sleeve, which looks so good on the CD set, appears to have just been blown up instead of copied from an original. The cover of Magical Mystery Tour also has a rather amateurish look to it. I don't know if they're all like this one, but the scale on the front cover is all wrong, which is clear when it's put next to an original. It's just zoomed in too much, and the top area above the lettering is cropped off. The White Album is a really first-class package, and comes with all its original inserts, poster, photos, and polyline black inners, which are a little kinder to the vinyl than the unlined, rough, matte black ones of the original. One of the best things about this set, which unlike the albums you couldn't buy separately, is the 108-page hardback book. It's a real quality production, full of wonderful photographs, reproductions of tape boxes, studio documents, clippings, and rare promotional material. It also includes Kevin Howlett's excellent essay, which apart from the opening two paragraphs is the same as the one in the 2009 booklet. It's a really superb book, and like anthology, something I never get tired of looking at. Every time I open it up, I see something new or discover some fascinating new detail. 
Everything about this set just oozes quality from the weight and construction of the box to the vinyl itself, all of which weighs in at between 190 and 200 grams each. I'm often asked how I listen to mono records. Well, if I'm grading one for sale, I use a normal stereo setup because it's more revealing and can detect things like groove wear and static crackle more easily. But what's the best method if you want to listen to a mono record in true mono fashion? Well, there are a couple of ways you can do that. The first method is to use a dedicated mono cartridge. In fact, Autophon created a special edition of their 2M mono cartridge as a tribute to this set. And that's a good, if fairly expensive, choice. The second way is, if you have an older amp, you may have a mono button or switch, which will do the job just as well. However, the third and cheapest option is the one I'm going to use for this job, and that involves two Y cables, like this. These are two RCA splitter cables, one with a male end and two female ends, and another similar cable, but with a single female end and two male ends. You simply connect the single ends together to make one cable. Then connect your turntable to the female connectors and the male connectors go to your phono amp. It's as simple as that. This will give you true mono reproduction without the expense of buying a mono cartridge or finding a vintage amp. So now let's get down to the real nitty gritty, sound quality. I'm going to listen and compare each album in this set with its original UK mono first pressing and see how well this set measures up against the originals. I'll also be recording them onto my computer so we can compare volume levels and dynamics etc. So let's go! Overall the sound quality of this set is truly outstanding. The main difference in sound quality between these and the originals is most noticeable on the early albums especially. To illustrate this in a more visual way, let's compare some waveforms side by side of some tracks from the original first pressings and from this set, which I recorded on the same equipment at the same volume each time. As you can see on this waveform of I Saw Her Standing There from Please Please Me, the main difference is in the volume levels between the two discs. The 1963 cutting on top was, like most records cut in the 1960s, cut loud and hot to make sure it sounded good on old systems such as this Danset Bermuda, a model owned by many British teenagers at the time. However, the VMS-80 cutting lathe used at Abbey Road to produce the 2014 discs was much more sensitive than the one used in the 1960s and was therefore able to create a better frequency range at a lower volume. So in order to see the difference in dynamics between the two, let's balance up the volume levels. Okay, there we go. At first glance, there's not a great deal of difference between them, and it's almost impossible to see the subtle changes in EQ. However, if you look closely, there is an increase in the number of peaks on the 2014 cut, which does indicate more dynamics. The 2014 disc is certainly easier to listen to at higher volume, and not as fatiguing on the ear as the 1963 disc at the same volume. This is all my loving from With The Beatles, and again it's very close and hard to see any significant differences between the two. However, feel free to pause the video and take a longer look for yourself, and leave your impressions in the comments. It's a similar story here on Tell Me Why from A Hard Day's Night. However, the spectral analysis of this track shows a clear frequency cutoff of 15k on the 2014 version, which isn't there on the 1964 original. This is rock and roll music from Beatles for Sale. The 2014 waveform is a little fatter than the original, suggesting it has a fuller, more fleshed out sound than that of the original. This is You're Gonna Lose That Girl from Help, and as you can see, it's virtually identical to the 1965 cut. It seems that even with the help of modern tools and technology, the team were unable to improve upon the album's poor sounding mono mix. The next one is Nowhere Man, with the initial withdrawn Dash 1 loud cutting on the top. It certainly displays a wider waveform than the 2014 cutting below, so it really was loud. However, that pattern is reversed on this, which is And Your Bird Can Sing from Revolver. 
Moving on to lovely Rita from Sgt Peppers, which is easily the most dynamic original cutting so far. Putting them side by side just shows how little difference there is between the original and the 2014, and goes to prove just how good that original mono mix really was. On the White Album, the 2014 cut appears to add more dynamics, at least on this track, Glass Onion, which is most notable when looking at the end section. While the sound of those early albums on the 2014 discs may suit the modern ear and system better, the vintage dynamics of the originals gave them, I felt, a little more energy and excitement which is missing from the 2014 recuts. But from Revolver onwards, I lean towards the sound of the 2014 discs. But sound quality after all is a very subjective issue, and it's all about personal preference in the end. I'm sure you have your own clear ideas about which version sounds best. After all, it's the music that counts, and both the originals and the 2014 discs sound amazing in their own ways. If you're looking to get hold of one of these sets, it's unfortunately long out of print and prices are steep on the second-hand market. You can still pick up the mono albums individually if you're lucky, but even some of those, like Sgt Pepper, are becoming expensive and you also have to be careful to avoid counterfeit copies. On the other hand, most original UK mono LPs, especially those which are in lower conditions, say in very good to excellent, are falling in price as supply has now caught up with demand. Although a black and gold Please Please Me, or a mint example of anything, will always be expensive. So to sum up, I'll say this is the best sounding Beatles box set to date. But what about the 1982 mono collection, I hear you cry? Well, that's a story for another day. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a big thumbs up and hit the subscribe button if you'd like me to do some more. But I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.